Okay, welcome back to Space Hulk Deathwing. This is a video I actually was initially planning on making immediately after the last one, but my throat has been a problem and uh, I couldn't record it that same night, so I put it off and then I put it off for two weeks, which is not what I meant to do. So I'm here having procrastinated on it extensively and taken a bunch of notes and probably not going to use as much of the notes as I want, but also wish I had written more notes. It's a whole thing. I couldn't entirely decide what I wanted to do with this video, but basically this video is my sort of picking apart of what's up with Deathwing, why is it not good, <laughs> and maybe how you can fix it, because I want to be positive about it, because I don't think there's nothing here. This isn't just a bad game. So, please, if you haven't already, I'm not going to address every single topic about this game um, in this one video. I'm not going to be comprehensive in the first place, but also I'm not going to rehash some of the stuff I talked about in the rest of this series. Uh, so, I made a lot of comments throughout playing the amount that I did play um, that I think go hand in hand with this, and those go more directly to some of the problems with... Um, the, the technical side of things, the technical problems with the, the game, and starting to direct at some of the problems with feel and um, a little bit of the other stuff that I'm going to start to talk about in a little bit more detail here. So let me get a sip of water real quick. So what's good about this game? Well, part of the reason we're standing in this room, and I considered just putting, doing a voiceover and then uh, layering it over existing footage from my previous episodes. I decided to come in here and actually stand in the game because here's the thing. The game is gorgeous. It looks good. Like, it can look good when it really wants to. Um, and that's part of the problem, actually, with the game, is that it shouldn't look this good, to my mind. Now, some of this is going to be objective, some of this is going to be subjective as I'm talking about this. Hopefully it's pretty clear which is which. I'll try and signpost it a little bit, um, but, you know, use your critical thinking skills. And feel free, if you feel differently, to leave your leave your, your comments. I'm sure there's a few people who already will. Um, I also want to make a particular nod to uh, a few people who have been watching the series and have commented um, on uh, my previous episodes. Uh, really appreciate the, the feedback, the insight, and the personal experiences because I'm always curious what other people's experiences with these things are. So, all right. The game is gorgeous. It really takes um, all of the, uh, the aspects of the 40K universe and really shows them off in ways that unfortunately are going to be completely underappreciated um, in a game like this. This is a game that is not about uh, enjoying the scenery. It's about um, trying to get from point A to point B for the most part and not die somewhere in the middle. Um, and even when you're just standing in a room like this, like it took me a little bit to even realize that like there are figures up there holding up the roof. There's so much little detail. And yeah, the textures are not the greatest, but like the design is absolutely there. They could have put so much less details into so many things, um, but this is made by Stroman, and I'm gonna I'm speculating because um, I don't know if they've said it explicitly ever. But uh, as I said previously, Stroman pretty clearly seems to love 40k or at least things like it. Um, I divine cybermancy reads pretty clearly as a knockoff of 40k um, and that doesn't even do it justice because knockoff suggests that it's a cheap imitation I is its own thing um, and is gloriously its own thing it's not perfect by any means um, but it's not just trying to copy 40k it's got its own things going on um, but it's clear it's always been clear that they wanted, they probably would have liked to have the 40k property. And they pay great honor to it by making this game and even Necromunda 
and uh, I don't know if they've been given the the license for anything else, but yeah, this is not without this is not made without love and care for the property um, by any means. So what did they make? They made something that has the name Space Hulk in it. That's a problem. This is not a Space Hulk game. And in fact, all of this scenery just doesn't really belong in a Space Hulk game. I don't mean that it should never be in there. I mean that it's largely not appropriate for the types of spaces that are mechanically necessary for a game like Space Hulk. So let's talk a little bit about Space Hulk. Um, also, a, a side note, uh, my knowledge of Space Hulk is somewhat limited. My knowledge of 40K is also limited. As, I, as I've repeated many times, I am what, what most would consider a quote-unquote casual fan of 40K. I've only spent several hundred hours um, researching and digging into the IP uh, and learning about it. Uh, I am not the tens of thousands of hours camp. Um, my knowledge is still not fully fledged, and my memory, even for the things I do know the best about, are not perfect. So if I get things wrong, you know, be polite. Politely correct me. But I'm going to try and recount what I can. Space Hulk is a game about exploring space hulks. We talked about this a little bit in the first episode. Space hulks, lore-wise, are what happens when ships get lost in the warp, in the Immaterian. Lots of ships go into the warp, not all of them come out. So there's lots of wreckage. Did that servitor just push me? That was interesting. Um, I didn't think I'd actually react to it. Anyway, um, I also just... I'm not halfway through the game, am I? This is weird. Okay, never mind. Um, getting distracted. <laughs> uh, Space Hulks uh, are what happens when a lot of those ships that end up in the warp end up getting smashed together in various collisions and corruptions. And sometimes they're not just smashed with other Imperial ships, they're smashed with all other kinds of things too. And then they get infested with space bugs and other things and then they're just horrible masses of ships and awfulness uh, and occasionally those things then fall back out of the warp into real space uh, and that's what the 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 Imperium refers to as a space hulk. Uh, in the traditional board game because yes, it was a board game first. And in fact, it was a PvP board game, if I remember correctly. Um, this is basically a dungeon crawler by the most, most standard terms you can think of. This is, this is cubes place of placement that you basically explore. You remember that game as a kid, Labyrinth? It's a lot like that. It's like Labyrinth, but more... Um, but more uh, more confusing, more complicated. It's um, I keep trying to stand out of the way of the servitors, but I'm the one in the way. I'm sorry, guys. Um, so what you essentially get, we'll just watch this guy for a little bit. Um, okay, guys, I was trying to get out of your way, but now where 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 can I stand to not be in the way? Uh, I'll stand in the candles. Um, Okay, I may have to split this video up. <laughs> uh, what was I talking about? Okay, um, it's basically a standard dungeon crawler, and it is turn-based. It's a board game. And most of the digital iterations of that game and the things that have cloned it, both of which I have played on this channel before. Uh, I've played the Space, or the, the Space Hulk game from like the mid-2000s, I want to say, and I've also played a clone of a Space Hulk game, uh, or, or a Space Hulk adjacent thing. Um, the, these are all about turn-based strategy, effectively. They are 
They are about uh, exploring an unknown space that is dangerous to you that you need to interface with. And largely it is essentially a risk reward management uh, thing. Um, my recollection again is that the original the original board game was PvP, which means one one player was playing as the uh, Terminator squad and one player was playing as the um, the opposing uh, faction, which was usually just um, uh, gene stealers or uh, tyranids of one one kind or another. Oh, this video is going to be very long. I'm just realizing as I'm as I'm thinking through what I want to talk about. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. Um, okay, so that is not this game. <laughs> this is not a Space Hulk game. This claims it's a Space Hulk game, and in fact, it is. Uh, it is a very good idea for how to evolve the Space Hulk idea. But part of the reason that Space Hulk re works the way it does and is limited in the ways that it is, is because it needs to be, in order to be mechanically sound. You need narrow corridors, both to surprise and alarm the player uh, of the of the squad, but also so that that squad can control their entrances and exits. Space Hulk is about a a squad that is powerful, but ultimately probably outmatched by their opponent. It is about either getting from one place to another, or clearing a certain space, or getting a certain objective and extracting, etc, etc. Those are the the things that you can do with a a game like that, a strategy game of that sort. So that still works in theory in this setting. But what they've built instead by accident probably is they built something that no longer works because you no longer have those avenues of control. What you have is these big expansive spaces that lore-wise are not inappropriate to exist. In fact, the whole, like, all the, all the Imperial ships are built both very practically and very ridiculously in that there's, there are these, these spaces are not absent on imperial ships these are very common everything we see in this game is totally reasonable and normal for imperial ship imperial the imperial navy but it no it does not serve the gameplay of space uh, a traditional space hulk game and it doesn't serve what they ended up building here either so to get into why it doesn't and why it's not really their fault, let's talk about the lore behind Space Hulks themselves a little bit more. Um, I'm trying to make a mental note of where I did this. So if I, if I have to break this video up, which I probably will have to, that I, that I do it. Um, so what are we? We are a Terminator squad. We are a, uh, a group of a couple ter suits of Terminator armor. Within them are Space Marines, Astartes, members of a chapter uh, that, in this case, um, uh, uh, the, the Death Angels, I believe. Is that right? I don't even remember at this point. Um, who are being sent into these missions knowing that the level of danger is some of the highest that they will ever probably have in their lives. These are largely the highest, some of the highest ranking members of among tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of members. 
uh, because the Terminator armor itself in the lore is incredibly rare. Lore-wise, just a tangent for just a second, the re a big reason why the the um, the armor is so rare is because they wanted to make it more. Um, in in short, they wanted to make more of it, and in fact, they wanted it to be standard issue to every Space Marine uh, at one point. But it became uh, economically and logistically impractical especially after the Horus Heresy, um, after which the, you know, the way that everything rolled out over the next 10,000 years, um, they basically could not, they, they, it would have been oppressing a very long, uh, a long road to do that in the first place. And after the Heresy, the, their economic ability to do that when they have increasing pressures and lesser resources it's totally impractical. So what is the Terminator armor? Well, it's basically the, um, it's the, not the biggest bipedal thing. Well, it's no, it's not even remotely the most biggest bipedal thing. It is the second, <laughs> how, do, how do I describe it? I think it is technically the biggest bipedal single manned uh, unit that the, that the Imperium has. We're not counting the slightly larger things because the people inside of those are dead, basically. That's a whole other piece of lore. <laughs> They're not really, it's not really people in there. Anyway, the, this is armor you can take off. But the whole point of why this armor exists is because it's for extremely hazardous environments with extremely high levels of deadliness. For example, gene stealers, which the Tyranids have re-engineered, re-biologically um, engineered over and over again, these are the enemies that we see most in this game, uh, that are meant to, that are like just ridiculous in their design. And this is lore-wise because the Tyranids have been incorporating the biology of other species for millennia. They have been taking the best of everybody's biology. Every time they capture something or someone, they incorporate their biology, they splice it together, they become stronger, they breed new, new uh, versions of themselves that are a little bit better than the last time. This is, again, part of the reason for the whole lore of what's in this game, or partial lore probably, is because we need, as I mentioned when we were playing, we need to retrieve um, the bodies of fallen Astartes because their genes and their organs are incredibly valuable to someone like the Tyranids. They're valuable to pretty much everyone, but especially to the Tyranids, if they could steal the genetic secrets of how the Astartes uh, exist, um, that would be an incredible boon to them. So you have gene stealers, which are Let's not say ground troops necessarily, but they might as well be for for um, our purposes in this in the Space Hulk setting that would in hand to hand combat with normal Astartes in their normal, extremely, extremely impressive armor, still tear them to shreds. Not that they couldn't hold their own for a little bit, but in one on one, they don't an Astartes doesn't last very long. Uh, without special equipment. So the, ter the Terminator armor is not only extremely large and extremely heavy uh, and, ext and extremely well armored, it's also got other things going on on it. Um, too many for me to probably get into and I'll probably recount some of it very wrong, but including included in, it's not just a big sheet of metal between me and my opponent. It is also um, basically force fields and also magical fields because all of the Terminator armors are also uh, sealed with this, like what's effectively a magical seal that has a little bit of the, the, the emperor's own armor in it that in lore actually adds an additional layer of protection. So you've got, this is an incredibly defensible, um, piece of equipment and yet it is still in lore supposed to be not impervious to 
things like gene stealers. They are dangerous. This is a dangerous job and I should be fearful. So now I need to, I want to pivot this into talking about the tone of the game, this game and the tone of other Space Hulk, Space Hulk games and Space Hulk likes. The point to my mind of a Space Hulk game is that you should be, the, the level of tension should be extremely high. A lot of it should be in your own head because you are going into the unknown. This is not a case of walk in like you own the place and battle many, many enemies believing that you probably can win. This is a, even for a, an extremely high level Astartes member um, wearing Terminator armor, this should still probably be a somewhat nerve wracking experience. I mean, as much as Astartes can feel nerves. Um, this is a concerning, this is a concerning experience for their continued life, basically. And so opening a door that is currently closed should be a dangerous prospect. And in this game it is, but in entirely the wrong way. It is a concerning experience because you have just opened up new avenues of attack, yes. But what you're looking at is a horde. Rather than uh, the typical layout for a um, really any uh, turn-based strategy game, but especially for Space Hulk, where you have a few individual enemies at a time, if more, it might not even be more than one at all, um, that should still be feeling like an existential threat. So the idea of there being waves upon waves of gene stealers coming after us that we just gun down is already a little bit silly. It is further uh, kind of broken, the lore-wise lore and mechanics-wise is a little also broken by the fact that those things that I mentioned about in the technical aspects of the Terminator armor are not really represented. And I can see why they did it this way, but I actually think it would be better if it was more lore accurate. The idea that the only thing that can keep us healed is healing from stim packs is a mentality that is extremely... It's extremely first-person shootery. That's the best way we can, we can say it. Um, the mentality that you need to take damage and you need to heal that damage is very simple RPG mechanics, but it doesn't really make sense for a Space Hulk case, to my mind. Space Hulk should be a, an environment where you might go in and possibly not even ever see an enemy if, you're, if, uh, if you happen to get incredibly lucky. We're talking in, in just in like in world type of stuff here. You might go in and see nothing, but it's still something you have to be incredibly prepared for. You might go in and only see a few enemies and maybe you might even avoid some of them because despite the uh, fanaticism of the ecclesiarchy and the Imperium as a whole, uh, engaging every enemy as soon as you see them uh, is not a good idea for the longevity of individual Astartes, the incredibly rare and valuable uh, power armor, or the Imperium as a whole. So the idea of you making tactical choices to avoid engagement, to create defensible positions and to fight under the absolute optimal circumstances at all times, that is the focus of the idea of a, an in-universe crawl of an Astartes, or of a, of, a, um, of a Space Hulk, as well as the gameplay of playing through a Space Hulk-like game. 
So instead we have waves upon waves of enemies that feel cheap. Okay, let's throw out some of what I've said before and start thinking about uh, what we could do instead. We're not going to make this into a traditional Space Hulk game. It's already a first-person shooter. What's wrong with it being a first-person shooter? Well, it's not very fun. <laughs> it's not very fun because it doesn't feel very fair. Because in order to take up some of the slack left behind in the transition from one genre to another, they've made um, a sort of unwinnable, uninteresting set of contradictions in gameplay. You have, essentially at the end of what they've concocted... Do I want to drop the bomb yet? No, I don't. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Um, what the, f the gameplay of this feels like is struggling to figure out how you're supposed to play. Because the, the space you're in seems to tell you one thing. The voice in your head, in your ear, on your comms seems to tell you another. And your experience in the gameplay seems to tell you multiple different things at the same time, none of which are quite working. So what you end up playing at first is you, or well, let, let's say me, because I'm the one who's playing it and I'm recounting my own experience. The first thing you do is you look at this and you go, oh, this plays like a horde shooter. This plays like something like Left 4 Dead. All right, why is it not good? <laughs> Why is it not good at being left for dead? Well, the reason it's not being it's not good at being left for dead is because left for dead and its ilk horde shooters are fun because you should have a feeling not only of uh, a level a certain level of fearlessness um, with intermittent tension and rises and falls in danger. You should feel empowered. You are the last survivors of whatever scenario. You are an incredible uh, power beyond recognition. You're slaying many, many enemies. Uh, they are, you know, falling in waves before your weaponry. Uh, that is satisfying, and it is also empowered further by your, not only your weapons and your abilities, but the mobility that you have. You've lost two out of the three, in this game. You no longer have mobility. You are uh, not able to retreat at a moment's notice. Um, your enemy is faster than you and comes at all kinds of angles. Uh, at, at angles you cannot anticipate or cover. So you've already lost that there. And then you are also not feeling very powerful, nor really should you, lore-wise, to slay tons of enemies. The, the few enemy types that we saw in this game, of which there were like, I mean, there's basically two flavors. It's basically humanoids and gene stealers, right? And they come in like two, three, four flavors each. Um, they're not very satisfying to kill, both because they are too hard to kill it requires too many shots uh, or too many hits of whatever to effectively dispatch them. They technically outmatch you. Uh, they take too long to eliminate and there are too many technical issues in the game itself, uh, in the game and its design and its stylings, including things like audio design uh, and animations that make the actual termination of your enemies not very satisfying. Compared to something like Left 4 Dead, the, there's no ragdolling, there's no satisfying ragdolling animations. The enemies don't bump into each other or into you. They don't run around uh, and have like notable uh, animations that 
seem to react to the world. They they seem very, very rudimentary. The AI is incredibly dull and dumb, and it does not react to the world around it, and it just makes it 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 behaves in a way that is not interesting to fight against. And when they die, you don't feel like you did anything meaningful because right behind it, probably clipping through its body, is another one of the same enemy that is doing a very jittery kind of weird animation and its foot is clipping through the floor and uh, really all you can think about is I need to gain ground. I need to kill these things faster than they are coming towards me. Your thought, comparatively speaking, is not let's get moving. It's I need to stand here and hope that there are enough bullets in my bolter and enough health in my armor and enough swings in my sword to dispatch this entire wave of enemies so that I can keep moving. Because moving at the same time as trying to fight is a losing proposition. That is for multiple reasons. One, like I already said, you are slower than your enemies. And let's be honest, the hitboxes are not great. So they will just sometimes hit you kind of out of the blue in a way that doesn't feel entirely great. Uh, they clip through each other. They clip through your allies. Um, your, your ability to actually defend yourself feels lackluster. So when you're slower than them, moving seems like a bad idea. Your best defense really seems to be a good offense in the hopes that you will end them before they can reach you. Um, so what do you, what have you made? You've made a, <laughs> you've made a tower defense game accidentally. Um, except instead of building towers, you've given me an open world from which enemies are going to spawn from many, many locations at seemingly random intervals. And when they do, I am going to have to hope that I'm in the right place to stop, plant myself, and put down a response with my weapons that leaves me not too far in the negative. Now, I'm not going to say in the positive because that's not possible in this game, nor really should it be. Um, but you've made a tower defense game and it's a bad one because I don't have the abilities, I don't have the powers, I don't have the, te the technology, etc., to make it a good tower defense game. A good tower defense game makes you feel like you've set up traps for your enemies, you've uh, set up good defenses, you've adequately prepared before they arrive, etc., etc. I'm not gonna get into as many reasons there why it doesn't work as a tower defense game as why it doesn't work as a horde shooter. Um, but this game could be either or both. Uh, there are, I like tower. I, I like tower defense games, and I even like horde, shooter, uh, horde shooters when they're when they're done right. Um, and so there are plenty of examples of how you could turn this into one of those. But it doesn't really make sense for the whole Terminator armor thing. So to come back around, by trying to stick with the idea of a typical space hulk game which you have already locked yourself into by virtue of keeping the same squad size and type the idea of this heavy terminator armor which you can't lore wise just speed up you can't make me faster than gene stealers that doesn't make any sense lore wise it's very weird you've already locked yourself into too many things by being space hulk now the beauty of 40k is that you can tell any number of stories in 40k. So you could have made a game that is um, that is other non-imperial groups exploring a space hulk. That could be a really cool game. Um, but with the way Games Workshop handles its IP, that would probably never exist. 
unless it was based on a book that somebody had already written for the Black Library, which as far as I know, there aren't any that are quite like that. So that ain't happening. Oh, okay. So let me let me catch my mental and physical breath for a second. The the nature of all this is further exacerbated by the problems with your own allies and their AI. Because as you heard me talk about while playing this game repeatedly, they are very unresponsive. And in addition to this being a horde shooter and also a tower defense game, it's also a real-time strategy game. And I didn't quite realize that until I was thinking it over again. But it is. It has many aspects of a real-time strategy game and also not enough of them. Now, I'm terrible at real-time strategy games. I'm not great at a lot of games in general. In fact, if I haven't said it already, I'm not good at this game. Uh, and yet, I don't think that's the reason I don't like it. Because <laughs> I'm bad at lots of games, and I still play them. Uh, but real, but real, I'll concede that real-time strategy is already not my cup of tea. Um, so, instead... This is a bad real-time strategy game because you have ally, you have very few allies who are also locked in Terminator armor, who are clunky and unresponsive, whose AI is poor, whose reaction times are poor, and who and that uh, and for whom the the orders that you can give are incredibly limited and come far too late. My one saving grace whenever I do occasionally touch a real-time strategy game is the pause button because it is your savior. Because I'm not good at high-speed processing. It's why I'm not particularly great at a lot of shooters in general. Uh, and so the ability to stop, take a breather, assess your situation, is critical in a real-time strategy game from time to time if you're not playing it well if you're playing it casually like me um, if you can't keep up with what's going on you're gonna have a struggle but that's again further hampered by your very limited control over your allies now watching watching me play this you would notice that I didn't play it super great in the first place I'm just gonna change our, our scenery for a minute um, I didn't play it super well in the first place, and I don't think that's any surprise to me and for longtime viewers of the channel. You'll probably also know that that's no surprise. Uh, I, I get too distracted by too many different things. Um, the idea of having to account for to other people's behavior, especially when their behavior is pretty bad and very limited, uh, is, is mostly just a frustrating prospect. I'll concede that is partially my problem, not the game's. But if I was going to rebuild it, uh, if I was going to improve it, uh, it, or even if I was good at that sort of thing, I would still demand much more from a game like this. I need more detailed commands. I need go here and cover this hallway. I need engage at this range. I need here's your area of defense. Um, protect it at all costs or protect me at all costs because there's a whole bunch of reasons that I'll get to in a minute why I need to be protected um, and having getting constantly frustrated with the behavior of the AI who has in addition to lacking all those things no self-preservation instinct and no uh, no internal logic to protect themselves or heal themselves, or really do any thinking for themselves. They are essentially an extension of my body. Now you could say, oh, that's lore-wise. They, they maybe they don't they don't do anything without my orders. I, I, I I'm sure there will people be people who have said that. No, uh, Astartes are yes, they do have a command structure and it's very fairly strict, but. 
well, it depends on the chapter. Um, but the like they are empowered as individuals as well. That's sort of a big thing for them. And so the idea that they would just stand there, not heal themselves, uh, and die in their Terminator armor is frankly just silly. Even if I don't have control over it, the game should at least provide a rudimentary internal logic of if you're taking critical damage, try and get to cover. If you have taken critical damage, try and heal yourself or your allies if you have the ability to do so. Um, and last but not least, last but most really, defend the fucking librarian. So, let's talk about librarians. It is weird, as far as I understand it, that there is a librarian on the team. Normal Terminator squads don't traditionally, it's not unheard of, but for a traditional Space Hulk clear, a librarian is not present. I already talked about this a little bit in one of the earlier videos, but the reason for that is librarians are like supers of supers of supers in the sort of they're they're kind of like just below chapter masters and the 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 you know they're like three four ranks down from the emperor basically in the hierarchy of who gets to start giving orders to astartes librarians are extremely few they are psychically attuned uh, and they are sanctioned psychers within the, the ranks of the space marines. Most, mo well, we could get into the, the details of like, are, are normal Astartes psychic? Yeah, they are a little bit. Um, but these are full-fledged, a librarian is a full-fledged psyker as far as I understand it, by all accounts. Uh, and they are incredibly important for a whole bunch of reasons. One, they are an Astartes. That makes them very important. Two, they are usually a very senior Astartes, one who has seen lots of battle, lots of experiences, and lots of unique experiences. Because three, they are a Psyker. Uh, they have a whole bunch of abilities, uh, like the electric throw and all that that I had the that are make them even more powerful and dangerous um, as a as a combatant uh, but also give them these other abilities like some of the things we started to see in the game their ability to sort of have premonitions and these other things and it varies individual to individual um, but their attunement to the warp their attunement to their psychic power, all these other things make them incredibly special. And so the idea of having a normal, a completely normal, otherwise normal structure for a Space Hulk walk be um, led by a librarian is already weird in the first place. It's not unheard of for a librarian to go on one of these. It's not unheard of for a librarian to wear a suit of Terminator armor. Again, they're one of the most senior members of a chapter usually. They've seen a lot that's usually, that qualifies them to be given the honor of wearing the Terminator armor for a while. Uh, and their life is probably one of the most important lives among the, the members of the chapter. So, at the very least, the other Astartes on my team, if I am playing as a librarian, should probably be defending me with their life. Uh, I would be, an, a, a librarian would be extremely well respected within their chapter and even outside of their chapter uh, because of what they represent. And so the idea that lore-wise, the AI would not be coded to 
defend me at all costs, basically, is silly. It doesn't make sense. It should just be assumed that that my life is more important. So that sort of wraps up the whole problem with the technical side of the AI logic or lack thereof. There are a bunch of lore reasons why they should already be doing those things, let alone the obvious gameplay reasons they should be doing it as well. So you've got a, a big game with a, a lot a lot going on like a very impressive a very impressive thing that honestly as I'm thinking and talking about it right now I honestly really want to see more of because at its core there seems like there might be an interesting story in here 40k is so easy and interesting to a, a universe to write stories within because almost everything you can think of is possible in one way or another. The main thing is that there is internal logic to the universe that you should really try and respect in order to make everything make sense, both, you know, to honor, to honor the accuracy to, to the lore, but also because those frameworks are already there to because you know people have worked out all the questions that you don't need to answer anymore the basic ideas that's that's the whole reason you do world building it's not it's not primarily for uh for the reader or the watcher or whatever the primary the primary reason you do world building is so that you can be believe you can make a believable universe for other things to happen in and that is one of 40k's very greatest strengths is that it is very believable. Um, it is a universe that has been fully fleshed out and described, and even in its ridiculousness, um, the logic exists for a reason, and many, many things are already explained. <sighs> so you've got game problems and you've got lore problems. What, how do you make this a good game, a better game, a playable game? Well, for one, this should be more story driven. The rest of this is gonna be strongly opinion and very speculative. Uh, this should be more story driven. It's already light. And we know from experience that Struman's strength tends not to be in its writing. They have ideas. They are very rarely well written and executed, at least for, for the kind of audience that demands basically well-written literature. I mean, there's a reason that the Black Library has so many books in it and uh, so many of them are well-loved and appreciated is that for the 40K universe is one full of book-reading nerds who like lore and uh, re reading about the weird niceties of some bizarre really specific thing that somebody's just conceived for the sake of, you know, making a weird story. So make the game story driven. Give us a clearer idea of what this group is here for. There's a little too much mystery up front, a little bit too much that's hidden, and a little too little that's explained. Because there's a lot that I can only appreciate about this game because I have the knowledge that I do. For somebody who came into this with no prior knowledge uh, of 40k or anything about it, nothing's going to make sense. 
um, the very base level of understanding the gameplay is going to be. And then they're going to look around and go, what is any of this? Like, it's cool. It's cool. It looks cool. These floating skulls with lights on them are cool. This guy, this Doc Doc, a Doc Ock guy is cool. I don't know what any of them represent. I guess I'll just be in this cool world. And suddenly, frankly, you've lost a big chunk of what makes this interesting. So lean hard into the story. Tell us a story about um, the ship that we have found or the Space Hulk that we have found and the specific chunk of ship or ship that used to chunk that used to be part of another ship, whatever the thing that we're on, the imperial, uh, the imperial navy ship that we are exploring, and the reason it's so important to us that we would bother to send a librarian. Tell us about the Astartes. Tell us about the librarian themselves. Tell us why uh, all of the things that I've just been telling you in the last. What's well, probably going to be a couple of videos because I'm probably going to break this up. Um, tell us about the lore. You don't have to be like super, you know, exposition about it. You don't have to read it like, uh, you know, uh, like a wiki entry. But get us engaged in the characters. That is one thing that for all of my gripes about the Space Marine game that came out some years ago and is now getting a sequel... One of the things I think it did best was, for all its flaws and all its problems, uh, show the humanity of this random ultramarine. Not random, but what is the humanity behind this Astartes that normally just looks like one of many incredibly bulky armored guys with a big gun? Tell us what's interesting about them. Tell us, show us that they are still human, that they uh, care about themselves, others, the work that they do, that the, um, there's an importance there that is not just uh, rah, rah, bang, bang. Get us engaged in the story. This only takes five minutes, maybe 10, if you really want to get deep into it right at the beginning, um, to say, uh, I'm going to just speculate about the story that they were going to tell here. Um, this ship was important to our fleet. We have signs from it that say that there might even still be people. There might be Astartes or other things on this ship that somehow survived 10,000 years in the warp that despite the warp itself and its corruption and the nature of Astartes to, despite their longevity, still not, you know, tend to live 10,000 years, they're still here, or they were, or they, ju they just recently were. There's a mystery here that's interesting to be solved. Maybe there are artifacts that were lost on this ship documented 10,000 years ago that we think might finally be uh, something that we can recover and finally put to good use for the Imperium's needs for our future because we have XYZ problem currently going on in XYZ location and if we could only finally get that tactical edge or that super super weapon or whatever it can be a fucking MacGuffin it doesn't matter it doesn't have to be perfect. There has to be something that's pushing us forward. So that gets us into, that gets us past sort of the character and setting stuff mostly. Okay, how do you fix the gameplay? All right, let's not go straight back to Space Hulk. If it wasn't clear before, I'm not advocating that. Turning Space Hulk into a first person shooter, I just, I just, had the realization that's more like um that's more like one of the modern 
first person horror games. I was going to say Five Nights at Freddy's, but it's one of the Freddy's spin offs or something like that. It's basically you would end up turning this into just a, a hallway, hallways of horror game that would be pretty dull if you tried to make it like a, a traditional Space Hulk game. So don't make it into a Space Hulk game. Let's turn it into an extraction shooter, which is almost what this is, but it isn't. So that requires a whole new thought process to the level design and a whole new thought process to uh, how we lay out our objectives and intentions. We're not going to go in as Astartes. Let's assume that we're going to keep the Terminator armor, that we assume that if we go in as Astartes, we will eventually hit something that will just kill us and uh, nothing, nothing else will be possible. So let's go in as uh, let's go in, in terminator armor and let's redesign the level so that you can still enjoy these beautiful scenes this beautiful scenery that has been painstakingly constructed but let's put it to better use let me get water real quick talking myself horse um let's put it to better use by giving us a different type of gameplay. It doesn't make sense, lore-wise, as we've already established, to be fighting hordes upon hordes of enemies. At least not very frequently. It's boring, it's not lore-wise very accurate, and it's not very interesting because we've already locked ourselves into not being able to move very fast and being basically outmanned and outgunned, let's say. So how do we turn that into, instead of instead of narrowing all the hallways back to what they were in Space Hulk, what do we do instead? We make better use of the layout of the ship. We design the ships in such a way that we do our best at all times to avoid confrontation. That our, we use all of the tools at our disposal because there should be many, many tools at the disposal of an Astartes team to scan the ship in every and any way possible ahead of time. Let's set up tactical routes. Let's find the places that we can fall back to in case of actual combat. Uh, let's um, find the ways that we can path through, lock doors behind us, reinforce them, whatever, um, to make them those, those uh, traditional space, uh, space Hulk mechanics more meaningful let's just use our our survival instincts basically to get our way out if you die in a horrible flurry of slashing attacks from a huge horde of of uh of gene stealers you deserve it because you did something wrong you walked into a room believing you were powerful enough to do that and you were wrong and as an Astartes, you should know better. So don't do it. Look for a different route. Cut a hole in a wall. Sure, let's make it a better animation than that stupid slapping motion I do with my sword against a piece of concrete that crumbles into five pieces. But let's cut holes in the ship. That's the whole point of like a Space Hulk, is it's a smashed up ship. There's already going to be cases where we need to cut through things because things are blocked off or whatever. Let's make better use of it. Let's get away from the traditional Space Hulk structure of only using doors, only using these narrow hallways and make it more realistic to what the lore might actually allow us to do. Because we have more freedom in a video game made in current year than we did in a board game made in, I think, the 80s. So give us the opportunity to make as many good tactical decisions as possible and give us a team who we like who understands us and who we can who who has good ai self-preservation and preservation of us and who we can give good instructions to um there's a whole bunch of ways gameplay wise you could work that out exactly but give us a way to have control that feels uh, sufficient 
control over them that lets us believe that they have our backs and we can trust them and that we are a team. Because right now, it just feels like I'm just another Astartes who just happens to be real slow for some reason with two other guys who I can barely communicate with who have no personalities of their own and barely react when the end of their lives come. There's a cool game in here. There's a cool game in almost every bad 40k game. And man, there are a lot, a lot of bad 40k games. But I don't think that this is unsalvageable by any means. But it does need to go dramatically back to the drawing board. I want to like this game. I want to like it so badly. It's super cool. I love 40k so much. Like... It's such a cool universe. And even when I think a lot of people don't understand why it's as cool as it is or completely misread the, the, the literary aspects of it and get the tone and meaning of what the writing is wrong, it's still super cool and smart and has a lot of opportunities for great storytelling and great gameplay. I've been here an hour and I don't know if I covered all the bases I wanted to cover, but maybe I'll do another follow-up video if I think of other things. I really like 40k and I want us to keep exploring it. So I'll be back with more 40k in some form or another in the foreseeable future. Um, to close this all out, whether this ends up being one video or multiple, if you've made it this far and listened to me ramble for an hour about this, thank you. Don't really know why you did that, but I'm really happy that you did, because I love this stuff. I love talking about it, even if it's just to myself. Um, and if you wholeheartedly disagree with me or you have different ideas or whatever, I am, as always on this channel, very open to hearing them. If you bring them to me, if you put them in a comment, and say something insightful and respectful and even if you say this thing is this lore thing you got totally wrong or uh you know whatever i i don't agree with you at all about how this should be interpreted or i have a completely different concept of what this game should look like and how it should be changed etc cetera, etc cetera. or even if you just love this game to death which i respect if you just enjoy it that's fine a lot of this this whole video has been I mean, this whole channel is just my opinions, mostly. Um, as long as you bring it with, you know, respect and kindness and an interest in having an open conversation, then please always leave a comment because I, I love this stuff. I love 40K. I want it to have better games. I want it to have more opportunities. I want it to be seen by more people and understood better and... Man, it's just cool. Anyway, I've been the social solipsist. This has been me rambling on for an entirely too long amount of time. This is uh, this is the end of Space Hulk Deathwing, whatever, whatever it's called. But I'm glad it gave me the opportunity to talk about 40k and this game and a whole lot of other things around it. Thank you all for watching and. See you guys for something different next time.